You're listening to the Weekly Wrap-Up on Sprott Money News. Happy Friday from Sprott Money News at SprottMoney.com. It's Friday, February the 19th, 2021. It's time for your Weekly Wrap-Up. I'm your host, Craig Hemke. Eric is still on the sidelines this week. And so we've got a returning guest, one of his friends, Bob Thompson. Bob, of course, Senior Vice President and Portfolio Manager with Raymond James in Vancouver. Old friend of Eric's. And also uh, an old friend now of the weekly wrap up, uh, Bob. Thank you for spending some time with us. Hey, Craig. It's always a pleasure to, to be on the show. Hey, just a reminder: we're going to talk a lot about the precious metals, obviously today. We're also going to focus on silver. Uh, great idea, always a great idea to add some uh, physical metal to your investing port- investment portfolio. Uh, one of the biggest questions that comes up when you invest in precious metals is where are you going to store it safely? Well, Sprott Money is one of the safest and most cost-efficient storage programs in the business. To learn more about our storage program, just visit SprottMoney.com, or of course, you can always give us a call at 888-861-0775. We are going to talk about a number of things with Bob today, from the economy to commodities and the ongoing silver squeeze. I know many of you uh, have missed Eric's contribution for the last several months, and I've missed it as well, but hopefully he'll be back soon. But he had a little something he passed along yesterday that he wanted me to share with everyone. Uh, Eric, through one of his investment arms, uh, has just very recently made another uh, almost $40 million Canadian investment into the PSLV, picking up uh, $3 million. Bob, what do they, they call those things up there? Shares? Units? $3 million, three million shares, yeah. $3 million shares. Right. All right, so, anyway, so Eric... Again, uh, just added in support of the cause of uh, squeezing physical silver, and we know PSLV actually owns nothing but allocated physical metal, 3 million new shares. Like I said, it's about 38 million Canadian, and he wanted to break that news here on the weekly wrap-up, and hopefully he'll be back uh, to discuss all this uh, uh, personally sometime soon. Uh, But Bob, uh, with that news in mind, uh, I want to move... I guess, into the regular part of the show. Let's talk first about economic news because uh, we've had another down week in gold, though silver is up. What have you seen in the economy this week? You know, it's, it's, it's crazy. I'm, I'm sitting here looking at the, the headlines from today, and here they are. Tre- Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen makes push for major stimulus, sees bigger risk in not doing enough. Jobless claims show unexpected move higher. U.S. producer prices post biggest gains since 2009. Household debt raises to fi- rises to 15 trillion due to record-breaking borrowing. I mean, craziness, craziness. Yeah. In, in any other time, if you were to if you were to look at that, this is so bullish for all the metals, um, gold, silver, and obviously, if producer prices start moving up, um, that's gonna that's gonna help out. Uh, you know, all, all the commodities, and you know. Ten years ago, during our last 100-year financial crisis, these things only happen every 100 years, okay, Craig? But they happen every 10, actually. <laughs> um, they're, um, our, our last crisis, they, they bailed out the financial system, as we know, right? Main Street got left on the sidelines. Obviously, we didn't see any inflation because that money never actually went through to the households. Well, this time, uh, they figured they got the banking system straightened out, so they had to bail out all the consumers, and they bailed out all the corporations. So what I mean by that is they're sending direct stimulus checks to everybody, right? Mm-hmm. Well, that those direct stimulus checks are going to Robin Hood, and they're going to people shopping, and they're going to um, all kinds of consumer activities, and that's why we're starting to see this inflation. So I'd be very surprised if, if we don't get some surprises on the upside as far as inflation is concerned, and all that's, all that's great for commodities. Bob, I'll let a couple more on you. I saw this week uh, the Institute for International Finance, whatever they are, uh, came out and said that the world added $24 trillion in new debt last year, <laughs> $24 trillion. And I just saw a headline this morning that on top of the $1.9 trillion in uh, what they call stimulus that they want to vote on next Friday in Washington, some Democrats are floating a plan for another $3 trillion in infrastructure. I mean, after a while, it's, we're talking real money, Bob. It's crazy, and you know, you know, Eric's an accountant, of course, right? He has, a, he's a CA, and he told me um, a little while ago. He says, you know, it's crazy the unfunded liabilities that they have on the U.S. government balance sheet that they don't put on the balance sheet, right? There's a side note, and you can see what they are. But he said, if they actually accounted for unfunded liabilities, 
Social Security, Medicare, everything else, which is over $100 trillion, he said they're not running deficits of, you know, a trillion to three trillion. You've got to tack on another four or five trillion a year onto that. Yeah. Um, for the unfunded liability buildup. So, you I mean, they're running in a normal year, you know, $5 trillion deficits if you look at the unfunded liabilities. It's just, it's just craziness. It's madness. Bob, then in the, in the vein of uh, rising tide lifting all boats, uh, yeah, gold has had a tough week. Silver's doing okay. And, man, the rest of the commodity sector looks like it is breaking out, starting a whole new kind of secular bull run. We've got copper over $4.00. For the first time since 2011, crude oil uh, at the highest level seen since early last year. Lumber is uh, setting new all-time highs on a daily basis. What do you think of the sector and, and the way that can kind of support even the precious metals? Very bullish on all the commodities because, uh, you know, what's happening with all of the commodities is also relevant to, to, to gold and silver. And let me, let me explain that. Um, you know, let's go back to 2000. I think we're around that time. I've said it many times that uh, we're at kind of the, the bottom here and uh, the techs are going to roll over and the U.S. market's going to roll over and commodities have got a, a good extended run, just like we saw at that time. Well, at that time, what surprised everybody was this massive demand from, from China, right? I don't think the demand this time is going to be as much because obviously all this printing of money is not pushing the GDPs like it, like it should be. But we've had such malinvestment in the, or disinvestment, I guess we should say, in the um, um, commodity space that we've got supply problems here. So even if we get a, a little bit of demand increase, the supply just can't keep up. And, and supply bull markets a lot of times are even more powerful than demand-driven bull markets because you can't just turn on a switch and increase supply. You can do that with oil. Right? You, can, you can say, okay, we've got some shut-in production. We're going to get some production up here in a month or two. You can't do that with mining. You can't, right. you know, it's a 10-year process. So, so all of the commodities, I think, are in the same position. Um, uh, as you said, copper is over $4 now. Um, there's not going to be a lot of investment in, 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 in the copper industry as far as copper companies are concerned until it's sustained over that kind of three, 375 area. Then they'll start to put some money into the ground. But obviously it takes years um, from, from there. I mean, these, these big copper mines in Chile, which produce a lot of the world's copper, have been doing it for decades and decades. And it's shocking the grades are going lower and lower yep. and lower. Now our technology is increasing, so they're making it more efficient, but still the grades are getting lower. And that's the same with gold. It's the same with silver. It's the same with all the commodities. We just aren't finding these massive deposits. So, you know, that, that, uh, and the great thing about mining is that the, the supply doesn't catch up with the demand right away. It takes a few years. That's for sure. And that kind of, we'll talk about the, the idea of squeezing silver a little bit as we wrap up. You know, that silver definitely lives on flow. Right? What do we? Maybe last year did we even get to 850 million ounces of silver mine, Bob, with all the COVID shutdowns? I hadn't seen no, the numbers. No, no, it, did, it didn't. At, at one point, you know, uh, obviously Mexico was a was a big factor yeah. there because most of the mines in Mexico were shut down. That's Correct. a large part part of the silver production. But uh, you know, that that's coming on board right now, and I think we're starting to see that with the cash flows of companies. Uh, a couple of the big companies just in the last couple of days came out with some significantly better earnings than people thought they were going to in the in the silver space so i think the market's going to look at that too as far as the shares are concerned yeah and, but, and that's that's but, eventually where it gets exciting bob is you chew up most of that silver supply with industrial demand it only leaves a little bit of money left over or a little bit of silver left over for investments right and and that that investment demand kind of ranges around 15%, generally speaking, but all you need, remember, all of these uh, moves happen at the margins, right? In, a, in any company, you know, their, 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 their profit margins move 1% or 2%, you know, that can, that can seriously impact their stock price, right? It's the same thing in the silver market here. You increase that investment demand component just by a few percent at the margin, and uh, it, it pushes the prices up, uh, up a lot. Um, you, know, you know what drives us nuts in this, in this industry? Uh, what you and I do is we're trying to solve, for you mathematicians out there, we're trying to solve a huge multivariable equation. And what I mean by that is the variable we're trying to solve for is what's going to happen to silver prices, for example. Well, when you're solving a huge multivariable equation, we have to make assumptions for all the other variables that are out there. Right? And the assumptions can be right or the assumptions can be wrong. But the fact is those assumptions have to change over time, too. And that's what's so frustrating as you look at things. And it might not work out the way you want it to in the short run, and it's because 
some other variable has changed that might be way down the chain that we that we didn't even see. So for for example, I mean, silver prices go up a lot, then people start melting down their silverware, right, and putting it on the market. Mm-hmm. They say, oh, I can I can make some money here. So you get some you get some supply coming in from from recycling or or whatever the case is. So you know that's what makes I think what we do kind of exciting, but it you know, pulls your hair out from time to time, too, because it's, it's all these um, multi-variables and a lot of variables that we don't even know are there. That's right. That's right. That's what makes forecasting so difficult, no doubt yeah. about it. Um, Bob, I want to get back to those ETS because, as, as I noted at the beginning of this call, uh, Eric moved uh, almost $40 million Canadian into the PSLV uh, earlier this week. Um, notice he did not buy the SLV. Um, you, you've got some thoughts on the ETFs in general, I'm sure. Sure. You know, you know, the ETFs are, are, are a great way to, uh, to, to suck up this investment demand if it's, if they're allocated, right? And I think that's a, that's a big deal. And a lot of people don't pay attention to that. And if it's the same as it is, you know, in, in the past, nobody will pay attention into, to it until something happens and yeah. somebody can't get their silver. Somebody realized that, the, that their silver is not allocated and that they want their silver, but somebody else has a claim on it, whether it's leased out or lent out or whatever the case is. And, you know, that's, a, that's just a huge pyramid scheme in the market. So I think, you know, that's important is to just make sure that a company builds itself on the fact, markets it, and has it, you know, where you can read it, that every single ounce is, uh, is uh, allocated and every single share or unit is, is backed by uh, by whatever the uh, the underlying is. Didn't we? Uh, I, I, I think I saw some numbers earlier this week about uh, how the PSLV has grown, especially since the silver squeeze movement began. Do you have those handy? I do have those numbers in front of me, and it's all public information, uh, right on various uh, uh, websites. But you know, PSLV currently holds about 113 million ounces of silver, and you know they have added over 52 million ounces of silver since January 31st, 2020. Wow. 50 million ounces in a year. That's a lot. Since February 3rd, 2021, you know, SLVs actually had outflows of 1.4 billion, Mm -hmm. interestingly enough, whereas PSLV has had inflows of 558 million. So that, that's an interesting data point, too. Yeah. It's going to be um, interesting, Bob. Well, I know they, they had a shelf offering um, that PSLV filed for about $1.5 billion last year. It looks like they're making some progress on filling out that offering. Yeah, I mean, I mean, people just have to make – people used to go to the store and buy a silver coin, and people still do that, and it's great. I mean, I have, I have a lot of silver um, that, uh, that I have stored. Uh, actually, it was brought money. But – you know, the ETF is an easy way to hold it in your brokerage account. You just have to make sure that you actually own it or that you can or if, if you have a significant amount of sh- uh, silver uh, shares that you can uh, get the silver if you want to. That's right. And to that end, like I said, uh, we know I have full confidence um, and, and Eric has ex- obviously expressed his full confidence. The PSLV has uh, every ounce that it says it has. You know, we don't know for sure about the other ones um, to that end, Bob. Because the system is leveraged and and hyper leveraged, perhaps you know there was a great piece from Ronan Manley at Bullion Star that eighty five percent of all of the silver in London in the London LBMA vaults is clearly spoken for. Um, I mean, if this investment demand part of the equation continues, I mean, you, I'm, obviously, you no know, doubt saw a couple of weeks ago where all the dealers were cleaned out right over a weekend, and this brought money was one of them. If the investment Mm -hmm. demand continues, and as we noted earlier, uh, investment demand only makes up maybe a quarter of total silver demand on an annual basis. If if that investment demand this year doubles, and all of a sudden we're running a supply deficit, I I don't know. What do you think, Bob? You've been at this a long time. Is it possible to kind of force the banks into starting to deleverage the system a little bit. Not maybe squeeze isn't quite the right word, but at least force them into kind of a deleverage. I, I, I definitely think um, they can do that. I mean, there's lots of levers they can pull. There's lots of things they can move from warehouse to warehouse and change prospectuses or whatever, yeah. whatever is needed to do. But I, I think you bring up a key point there. And the key point is 
that this is a cumulative game. In other words, just because the system doesn't break right now, it's cumulative. The stress is going more and more and more onto it. And I equate that to, to an avalanche. You look at the side of a mountain and you say, wow, that thing is unstable and it's ready to come down. But the snow comes on it and it doesn't this season. This season, it looks fine. And next season, it looks fine. That doesn't mean it's any less dangerous. It right. means it's actually a lot more dangerous because it, it looks completely stable right up until the second that it collapses. And, uh, and obviously, the force will be three or four times if it, uh, if it hasn't come, come down in the last two or three years. So what I'm trying to say is this is a cumulative effect. The more pressure that, that's put on the system, when it breaks, it's going to break that much harder. And I think that's really something that people have to, uh, have to pay attention to. Just because it doesn't break now doesn't mean it's not going to. I like that analogy, Bob. That's a good one. Well, you know, you know what it feels like with silver right now, too. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm looking uh, here today, and it's up uh, almost two percent. Another good analogy is it just feels like it was silver right now. It feels like they're trying to hold a beach ball underwater. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can do it, but it keeps pushing and pushing and pushing, and and when you let go, it pops back up, and it just feels like that with silver right now. Yeah. Yeah. Now you can see this on the chart. Silver looks much better on the chart. I mean, radically different from the chart of gold. And actually the silver miners, Bob, is uh, they look a lot better than the gold miners. So as we wrap up, I'd, let's kind of appeal to your day job. You mentioned uh, margins at the silver miners and a lot of their earnings reports have been great. Uh, can you give us a few insights uh, from the gold digger? Or maybe tell us about the mining clock and uh, maybe other things that might be on your mind as we wrap up. Yeah, exactly. You know, it, and and uh, gold's always first out of the gate, right? Then the other commodities tend to catch up, and that's what we're starting to see now. And then silver, at the you know, as we get closer to the end or middle of the cycle, becomes um, an industrial metal and a monetary metal, right? Because it it is both. So that's why you get the significant outperformance of silver, and I think that's what we're starting to see right now. But um, you know, I, I have a chart in in the latest gold digger that I that I did. That, that shows the gold mining stocks to gold bullion ratio is hasn't been this low in 25 years, wow. right? Uh, so it means money hasn't moved into the sector yet. And you know, it makes sense. Why does it make sense? Because you've still got all the tech stocks rolling. Um, people are all focused on something else other than the precious metal sector. But w- what I mean by that is the leverage you know, when, when these things start to move and people say, okay, we've got to, got to look for the next sector that's going to do well, and the money flows into this sector, you know, that gold mining stock to gold bullion ratio can, can, can double, plus the stocks um, do well on top of that. So that's why it can be explosive on the upside as far as these companies are concerned. The other thing about the silver miners is that there are very few um, silver miners that make almost all of their cash flow from silver. Right? There's, there's a few that are over 50%, but most of them are actually less than that. But what's important here to remember is that what else are they mining? Well, they're mining zinc, they're mining lead, they're mining nickel, they're mining all of the other base metals. And all those base metals are, are kind of exploding upwards as far as prices are concerned. So the silver miners kind of get that, that, that base metal exposure if we're yeah. in a good commodities bull market, and they get, their, uh, they get their silver exposure. So I think that's important to remember about the silver miners and, and why we're especially positive on them going forward. Yeah, and, and to keep in mind, it's going to be a long, crazy year. I remember the last time we spoke back in January, uh, the metaphor I used is uh, trying to ride uh, you know, an actual bull in a bull riding competition, you got to stay on that baby all the way to the bell if you're going to win, and it's going to try to throw you off the whole time. And that's kind of what's happened so far this year. That that is right, and, and you know that's a normal bull market, right? Um, you know, if we look back ten years, a lot of the people that were bullish on the U.S. market, well, it turned out to be right. The U.S. market's done pretty well, but there was a lot of severe corrections yeah. in there along the way. And if they weren't true believers that they were right, they would have been knocked out, right? And it's the same thing in the it's the same thing in the in, in the gold sector here, and you know that's why I think the mining clock's pretty important. And again, in the last gold digger, I. I put the mining clock in there that we're probably around 630. Um, and I think it's important to mention that because I'm going to change the mining clock a little bit to, to reflect the different metals, right? Because I think gold and silver are probably 637 o'clock. You know, I think, I think copper and some of the other base metals are a little bit further back on the clock, which is mm-hmm. important to, to, to see. And, uh, you know, as far as uranium, we're probably still back at, uh, you know, four o'clock, which is, um, which is just the beginning. So, 
you know, I, I think it is it is different with the metals. And as we continue on in this uh, in this uh, economic path, we're going to start to see some divergence as far as the uh, as far as the metals are concerned. But I, but I'm pretty bullish on uh, on most of them here. Bob, it's always great to talk to you. I think in the past, maybe you've shared your email address if people want to reach out to you. Sure. Uh, Thompson Investments at RaymondJames.ca. Thompson with a P, right? Yeah, Thompson with a P. That's gotcha. right. Thompson gotcha. Investments. Bob, thanks so much for everything. It is always great to visit with you. Hey, on everybody on your way out, we appreciate you listening. Uh, to the weekly wrap up. Also, Ask the Expert also can be found uh, here at Sprott Money. A great interview uh, earlier this week with Danielle DiMartino Booth. You might want to hunt that down. All of this appears on YouTube and on various uh, podcast platforms. Please do us a favor. Give them a like, maybe subscribe, and even share on whichever channel you're listening to. It'll help the distribution of this information, and that's That's the name of the game. Bob, thank you so much for all your time. Really enjoyed it this week, Craig. Thanks a lot. It's always great fun. And from all of us here at Sprott Money News at SprottMoney.com, thank you for listening. We'll talk to you again next Friday. 